Cool. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our latest webinar um, here at How Now. Uh, today's session is around the state of sales training in 2022. Um, today, I'm joined by two awesome sales pros in Chris Hatfield, um, founder and CEO of Sales Psyche, and Liz Muse, head of sales at Unibuddy. Um, just as we're kind of waiting for a few more people to um, join the webinar, perhaps um, I can hand over to you two to give a quick introduction um, your background and kind of why you're here today, but also um, in the spirit of learning, uh, which we obviously love here at How Now. Uh, maybe you could share with us your kind of like uh, biggest learning so far for um, 2021. Um, Liz, why don't we start with you? Sure. So thanks for having me. My name is Liz, um, and I'm like James said, the head of sales at Unibuddy. Um, I joined Unibuddy about a year ago, so I did a very 2021 thing and left my job of five years without ever having met someone in real life or been to an office, which was a really weird and very current uh, current experience. And um, yeah, in terms of my biggest learning, I think it's been to uh, not sweat the small stuff. Um, previously, I've really worked with um, a lot of SDRs. And so I think there's a tendency for SDR managers to want to see people at a desk and see them coming back from lunch and, you know, keep an eye on their every move. And virtually you just can't do that. And I think it's taken me, you know, the better part of a year to let go of that and to, to just trust that people will crack on and do what they need to do. And if they don't, then, you know, then you can start to have those types of conversations, but really need to don't sweat the small stuff and just let go of things that you can't control. And it's been very helpful for me. Yeah, great. And uh, Chris? Yeah. Hi, everyone. And James, thanks for inviting me onto this as well. Really looking forward to it. Um, so as you mentioned, I set up a company, Sales Psyche, about a year and two months ago. A uh, big focus is all around mindset and improving mental well-being within the sales and commercial space. Um, reason I set it up kind of was the pandemic, actually. It was, you know, mm -hmm. I think, and we'll probably come up today, I think mental health is a topic that we speak about a bit more now, but still very much from a reactive point of view. So my big passion and focus is focusing more on the preventative and proactive side of it. Um, my big learning, I suppose, having set up a business as well, but also working with a number of companies over this last year is just, you know, not giving yourself some flack, giving you, you know, giving yourself that self-recognition is really important. And I think we'll talk about a bit more about that later is that we're pushing and pushing so often for things that it's really important to take stock and recognize and, and look back sometimes and see how far you have climbed the mountain, even if you're you're not where you are yet. So that's kind of the big thing that I've sort of been trying to remind myself of. Yeah, great advice. Thanks, Chris. Cool, looking forward to it, guys. Let's get into it. Um, so I kind of thought the first, um, you know, topic that we can discuss, um, which, you know, has been, you know, the topic of conversation for a while now is hybrid working, you know, remote selling. Um, just to kind of give you a few, you know, I guess stat bombs, so to speak, to kind of, uh, you know, get the brains going. A uh, few reports to kind of highlight um, HubSpot's 2021 sales enablement report um, indicated that around 64% of sales leaders who have adopted this hybrid remote model long term have actually met or exceeded their revenue targets. And 57% of those respondents stated that in 2022, you know, they have no plans to change that. They are going to continue and adopt this hybrid remote working. And from a buyer's perspective, um, a LinkedIn report actually indicated that around 50% of buyers believe that remote working has actually um, improved the purchasing process for them. Um, so all the stats, all the indications seem to indicate that people are kind of happier and thriving under this new model. Um, so I guess, you know, open question first and foremost, maybe to Chris, you know, what's, what's changed? Has anything changed? Um, you know, and are we looking at an entirely new breed of sales reps altogether? Yeah, I think I think so. I think for me, like when I was thinking about this, this question is it's just another filter for people to choose and go through um, from what yeah. they're happy with. I think there is no right or wrong answer here. I think it's just the nature of it's similar to how we learn, isn't it? Really, you've got mm. people who learn visually, kinesthetically, auditory is the same as how people work is some people will actually naturally gravitate and think, I want an environment where I know I need to be in the office every day because I know I can't work well from home. Others will be like, I don't see the point in that. I really value my my time and my life outside of work. Maybe they're a bit more of an introvert as well and actually prefer, you know, that kind of space. Um, and salespeople can be introverts, contrary to maybe some myths. And then you've got people in between who, who, who like the option. I think over time we'll see um, companies who start to say, right, this is what we stand for. This is what's important to us. Well, then naturally um, they'll gravitate towards towards those people. And, you know, sometimes you might lose people from it. 
um, but you'll also gain people. And I think it's just, you know, a company being comfortable with saying this is what we are, this is what we stand for. Um, but also the companies, I feel like, who do want people in the office, whether it's hybrid or full time, need to focus more on how they inspire people to do it versus demand it. Mm. I think it's very easy to sort of say, right, we, we need everyone coming into the office, but people are like, well, why? You know, if you're if you're inspiring people, obviously, you know, around what you can learn from each other, the culture, the environment, and actually thinking, how do we get people to want to come in versus need to? Then you're going to create a better atmosphere and environment, and people are going to want to stay for it and recognize, maybe even changing their mindsets of actually, do you know what? I did think I wanted to work from home, but yeah. through this, the company have actually given me more of an idea and understanding of why I benefit coming in. Mm. Are you, as a follow up, Chris? Are, are you seeing like certain companies or sales leaders? you know, come to you for advice of, hey, Chris, actually in 2022, we are going to have like, people back to the office full time. Like, how, how do we inspire those people to kind of, you know, want to come back? Yeah, yeah, I think um, I think the majority of people I was speaking with have, have sort of done a hybrid model. But right. um, I think pr uh, for the new starters, particularly, there is a very big focus on we want you in mm. um, as much as possible to obviously set the right kind of habits and foundations. But again, I've been, been talking to them about, you know, always explaining why you want them in. Why is it a benefit to them? What are mm. they going to get from it? Not just you thinking. Because if you don't, then people think, well, you just don't trust me. Or you yeah. think you're just asking me to come in for the sake of it. Well, I'll go I'll go here where they don't want me to. Mm. And, you know, I think it's just as about in talking about not just what you can gain from it, but what you can lose from not coming in. Yeah. Um, and rather than treating it just a one way thing of going, right, this is what this is who we are. This is what we stand for. And you like it or lump it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think, you know, you know, Liz obviously um, joined and onboarded Unibuddy during the pandemic and remote working. And I did here at How Now. And I think I realized that the biggest thing I missed that not going into the office, specifically for onboarding, is actually that osmosis piece. Like just learning from people through osmosis. It's, it's really, unless someone could tell me otherwise, it's quite impossible to kind of recreate that um, from a remote kind of standpoint. Um, so I think for me, like if I'm recruiting people now and trying to get them into the business, I think learning through that osmosis piece is quite, quite key for me. Hmm. Um, Liz, how about you? I mean, you've obviously, you know, got quite a large sales team as well, obviously working remotely from all corners of, of the UK. Um, what are your thoughts on it all? Yeah, I think there's, you almost want to create a sense of FOMO because to Chris's point, you don't want people coming in just because I told them to, because then they'll start to resent you and, you know, this doesn't create a good vibe within the team. Um, something that I've kind of been toying with is creating like anchor days where I'm not saying you have to be in the office, but like, hey, a lot of people are probably going to be in this day. So there's a like, a, yeah, FOMO that's created naturally. Um, so you can set up either a happy hour or training or something that people will see an actual benefit in coming into the office for. Um, cause one thing that it's, it's funny to see when I'm personally, I'm going, <clears throat> going into the office fairly regularly. And so mm. you'll see people come in and be like, Oh, I didn't know you were going to be in today. Um, and so if you set the, the expectation that on these three days a month or something, um, the majority of your team is going to be there that you can create that community that sometimes can be lost, um, as well as that osmosis learning, I couldn't agree with that more. It's uh, very important and hard to facilitate via Zoom. Mm. And I guess um, another question for you, Liz, like with a, with a large team, you know, I think one area of concern for me or a challenge is like the word favoritism. And I mean that in the sense of there are going to be some people who want to come into the office more than others, right? And how do you not you know, kind of like favoritism on those people? Like, how do you create, you know, a sense of like equality from those people who want to come into the office more than those that, that don't? Are you kind of thinking about that kind of thing as you kind of move into the new year? Yeah, it's tough, to be honest, because, you know, naturally, I think one of the biggest things uh, that I picked up during the initial lockdown was that it's really easy when you're done a meeting just to close your laptop and it's only about business and you mm. lose those like, you know, walking out of the room, going to the coffee machine, like, oh, I'm going to go for lunch. Do you want to come with me? Like all of that kind of personal rapport building mm. kind of falls away. And so I think your point around favoritism, it's it, it, it's easy for that to become the case. Um, I think by inviting people in and then also just making sure that you use your full your full hour. Like if we talk for 45 minutes about work and we still have 15 minutes, like don't don't shut your laptop immediately, like spend that time, ask those questions. You know, it's a little bit different over Zoom, but 
there are people who I've literally never met who I would consider friends, if that's a weird thing to say, like that, you know, I know what their kids are doing this weekend. And, you know, I know what they were doing three weeks ago. And, you know, it's you can create personal relationships, but I think it just looks a little bit differently than it used to when we were in the office. Yeah. Any insight from you on that, Chris? I mean, you speak to a plethora of sales leaders. Are they kind of thinking about that kind of challenge around favoritism? Yeah, I think so. Um, I, uh, um, I'd say the majority are probably actually. It has it has come up, especially like unconscious biases as well around yeah. it. Um, and I think it's, again, like recognizing that if you are going to be hybrid, if you are going to say, then you need to make sure that it's reflected in, you know, when opportunities come up for promotions or or other things. Or if, for example, you're going to communicate things with people in the office is thinking, you know, it's very easy sometimes to see someone in the morning go, oh, by the way, this is happening. But the mm -hmm. what you want to be doing really is going, well, actually, I need to tell everyone at the same time versus just because it's easier, because then people do yeah. start to feel like they might hear it through someone else on Slack and go, oh, do you know, this is happening today. And then they come into that meeting yeah. and they've got this story in their head already about this happening is you know, thinking how you communicate effectively um, if you are going to stand for it as well and ensure that everyone sort of feels like, you know, they're they're in, they're in aligned and they're connected um, with that. And it's not just this kind of add-on. If you work from home, you're kind of forgotten about out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, definitely. One and thing, I think... Um, sorry, sorry, just to, to add on to that, one thing that we've been doing recently in like big group meetings is that even if you're in the office, you should still be on camera. So if you're at home, you still get like 15 people's faces rather than just like one screen with like six people huddled around a desk. Um, and that's made a huge difference. So yeah, just to add on to that in terms of visibility and how you transcend information, um, that's been really important for us and something that's worked really well. Yeah, it's a good tip. And I guess the other part of remote working is remote selling, right? You know, the way we sell to our customers has changed massively. Um, I mean, it's quite seldom now that you see a rep put his coat on, put his bag on and say, right, I'm off to hit the road for the day and do a load of face to face meetings. I think they're coming back, uh, but not kind of, kind of on the same scale that we once knew. Do you think this is it? Like face to face meetings are somewhat redundant now. Can you see them coming back in 2022? Um, Chris, maybe you can kind of take that first. Yeah, I think it comes back to the the first point as well of um well, there's a few things here. I think it's sometimes okay. these kind of shifts cause people to actually to reflect and go, why, why are we doing what we're doing? Like, what's the point mm -hmm. of it? Um, and, you know, for example, when the phone first came in or email first came in or video first came in or voice notes is, is getting people to actually reflect and go, okay, you know, what are the benefits here? Um, just because it's different. And yes, there are benefits to being face to face, but there are also benefits yeah. from virtual. You can get a lot more people in one room for a short amount of time. You can often sometimes speed things up as well. I think the benefit now is you've probably got prospects and customers more willing to go on video, whereas before it would just be majority of the time on the phone, whereas you can probably get that involved a lot sooner in the process as well, which I think makes it easier to build that relationship versus the first time you see them is in person near the end of the deal. Um, yeah. And again, I think it comes back to if you do want to, it, you need to inspire people. You need to make it worth their mm -hmm. time because people are used to doing stuff on Zoom now. So if I'm mm -hmm. going to demand that, I, if in my head I'm thinking I want to meet you face to face because it's going to benefit me, and you think, well, what are you going to get out of it? Like, why should you give me an hour or two of your day in person when you could give me half an hour on a Zoom? Like, what yeah. am I going to do differently? And I think people need to start thinking about that versus just, well, oh, you know, I'm really good in face to face. Is well, okay, but what's in it for the customer or the prospect? Yeah, great point. Um, Liz, anything to add on that? Yeah, I don't know if this is like. Uh a point per se, but I'm, I'm, I guess I'm curious about cultural nuance with that. Um, mm -hmm. because I know some, some cultures, for example, like I always think of France as being a, a good example of this, where, um, I think someone told me very early in my career and working uh, in EMEA that like, if you went into a dinner and asked, you know, for commercial terms during appetizers, you'd be laughed out of the restaurant. Um, and so in cultures where there is a little bit more of like, a yeah, in-person relationship buildup that happens over time. I'm curious if they would be as quick to adopt um, or if we might see them swing back to kind of those more traditional in-person relationship building um, routes that they had previously. But I think for, I would say in the States and in Canada, for sure, I think things are just going to continue to become more uh, streamlined and in the UK as well. Um, but I think there might be a, a difference in how we see that that uh, settle in other cultures. Yeah. I think one, one thing from my perspective is, um, you know, uh, way back when, when I was kind of, you know, an account exec, going to see a customer face to face, 
some of the most powerful time was usually your, you know, champion or, you know, decision maker would meet you in reception, take you to the meeting room and walk you back to reception. That back and forth from the meeting room to reception is really critical time with your prospect. It's actually mm -hmm. where you can ask questions like, how do you think that, how do you think it went in there? You know, if this, if this pulls off, like what's in this for you? We, we kind of are missing a little bit of that now. And I think mm -hmm. one tip uh, that we've been doing here at How Now is, you know, at the end of the Zoom, if you know that um, Liz or Chris is your main contact, you know, just say to them, would you mind just staying on for another couple of minutes while everyone else drops off? So you've just got that kind of one-on-one -on -one time with them to kind of ask those questions and try and replicate that mm -hmm. kind of like walk back to reception. I don't know if anyone else has kind of um, experimented with that. Yeah, I think as well, just being mindful of time, if, if um, mm -hmm. you're trying to book rather than an hour out, for example, or half an hour, booking mm -hmm. like, 20 minutes for it or at least trying to finish on the 20 minute marks you know mm -hmm. unlikely that they'll have something in between that gap before the next meeting because yeah. mm -hmm. you know if you finish half an hour on the hour then of course they're probably going to be rushing to something else so i think always trying to do that and i was then trying to frame it at the start saying have you got a few minutes at the end of this while you're yeah. waiting for or ask them do you mind jumping on a couple of minutes early um yeah that contact beforehand yeah yeah for sure um, I guess we better move on to the, the next section. We could get stuck on this all day. Um, but I know that the next one's, um, you know, something that's passionate for us all. And, and Chris has obviously, you know, built a business around it. And it's, it's you know, keeping reps happy and their well-being. Um, you know, I think 61% of salespeople feel underappreciated, which is a frightening statistic. But I think one we can probably all understand and relate to. Um, and also a general trend trend is, you know, I think 94% of people through a study of KPMG said that they're feeling stressed and burnt out. Not surprising at all. Um, and with sales, like it's notoriously always on high pressure role. Um, you know, how can employers do more to support teams, mental health and well-being? Um, I know Chris is going to have a ton of answers for this. <laughs> so I don't, I don't start with Liz. Sure, Yeah. Um, I think one of the biggest learnings for me has been that what my team need is, needs is not what I need. Um, and I, although that sounds like a pretty simple term, like really reminding myself of that, like personally, no news is good news. And, you know, if you say you did a good job, like I want to hear that like once a year and then I'll know I really did something good where there's other mm -hmm. people that need that reassurance more frequently. Um, and it, I still have to like actively remind myself that like you need to say that like you did a good job or remind someone of that or say thank you um mm. and those little things can really go go a long way um and then also just checking in with people and like having a sense of what's going on behind the screen um and going back to my earlier point like don't close the laptop if you're done at quarter after like make sure that you spend the whole amount of time talking to people and understand what it is that's going on and you know, you can also, you know, people really well, even if it's through a screen, like you can tell when someone's annoyed or not paying attention in a meeting and, you know, mm -hmm. just checking in and saying like, hey, is everything okay? <clears throat> Sorry, I can really go a long way. So that's kind of how I've been approaching it. Yeah. And Chris, from your perspective? Yeah, I think the, the it's kind of links to one of the other points um, around credit. We often focus on, you know, are people being underappreciated? Are we giving them enough support? I think it, it needs to start, it needs the right environment, but it needs to start with the individual, first of all, about, and I know you, I think you saw a post of mine the other day, James, talking about this, yeah. where we're too often we're our, our biggest critic, but never our biggest fan. And mm. I think w the problem with becoming uh, focused on external recognition, we become too reliant on it. Um, mm. And we can almost go chasing it for that buzz, that high, similar to deals and people confusing that kind of happiness of excitement a lot of the time. Um, mm. But I think it's really important for people to get comfortable with giving themselves credit. I said the other day, kindness doesn't equal complacency. I think it's very easy a lot of the time for people in sales to sort of have this sort of voodoo feeling sometimes of, oh, I can't give myself credit. I can't say that because what happens if this happens? Or what if I come across as too arrogant? But of course, how you talk to yourself um, sets the tone for every other conversation you have. And I think a lot of the time, if you're not giving yourself recognition, you'll become overly reliant on external and it will it will come, it will feel good for a bit and then it will go and then you'll be left in that kind of loophole again of seeking it um, rather than actually going, well, how do I give myself credit? How do I start recognizing like what I'm yeah. doing and, and validating that first and foremost because that's the most important thing. I think yeah. from the other side of it is managers and leaders and companies need to really focus on how are they recognizing the process of what people are doing, not just the outcome. I think this is where that, kind of feeling can come from sometimes there's a great book i'm 
uh, Carol Dweck mindset that talks about this around the fixed and growth mindset. And they did a study where, you know, they split these 400 students. They um, recognized half of them saying, you know, you must be really intelligent to do. I've, I've done so well on this test. And the other half, um, you know, you must have worked really hard for this. And they actually found that people were then more likely to take more risks. The ones that were recognized for process, they're actually performance went up. They were more resilient to things versus the mm. others because if all you do is recognize outcome people will then think well i can't do anything outside of this to jeopardize that because that's the only reason you recognize me versus yeah. recognizing the input i think people will value um over time then see okay you know i'm willing to do this i'm willing to put myself out there i'm willing to make mistakes because i know that's how i'm going to grow and develop um, yeah around it and then i suppose from the, the mental health support side of things is first and foremost focusing on how do you support someone as a person first and foremost, rather than a number. So if you do really care, and I think the big thing is focusing on what you do, not what you say. It's all very well saying, we, you know, we've got an open door policy. Well, a lot of people don't want to come and talk to you right now because they think, well, you know, what happens if I lose my job? What happens if I say yeah. this? And I'm, you know, I'm the vulnerable one. Um, is going, well, how do you do that? How do you set the tone yourself? How do you share what's going on in your world? How do you start your one-to-ones with that kind of thing rather than just have it as an add-on? at the end mm. like how do you actually check in with someone versus just going how are you and brushing over it and them going not bad and you just going right okay let's go into the numbers and yeah. the final thing i think is addressing the elephant in the room so mm. actually you know we talk a lot about when someone comes in about the vision about how good you know where the company's going the product what we're trying to do but we don't talk about the hard stuff enough mm. and people then start to feel it and go well no one else has talked to me about this in the business so therefore i must be the odd one out Maybe I'm not yeah. right for the, the company. Maybe I'm not right for the business. And I think it's important. Yeah. We set people up for success, but we need to set them up and prepare them, prepare them for failure. And it's yeah. not saying we accept failure. It's saying it's part and parcel of what we do. And when it happens, this is how you deal with it. Because sales is a funny game, isn't it? You can lose the majority of your deals and still be very successful. But you yeah. almost act every time you lose something that it's this kind of like, you know, taboo and it can't happen. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting point. I think you've touched upon something there, Chris. Like, you know, I was just thinking as you were saying that of, you know, right now, how now and many businesses are, you know, kind of devising their 2022 strategy for revenue, right? And we're sat there thinking, how many reps do we need? How much pipeline do those reps need to hit those numbers? What we're not really doing, you know, certainly not well enough is, and how are we going to support those reps from a mental health and well-being perspective so they hit their number mm. like are there things and metrics that we should have in place to kind of you know uh, help them and support them more in those things I, you know pe speaking personally i could be doing way more of that um and maybe other businesses are good i don't know if chris if you've got any kind of insights from the people that you speak to around how do you incorporate mental well-being and, and health into your kind of sales strategy and revenue yeah, I think um, I use the analogy a lot of the time, you know, if you're preparing someone for a marathon and you've got to look at have you got the equipment and everything around them to to be able to do it, particularly if you are, which often we are always doing, asking people to go, right, we want you to double your target, go up by 30 or 40 percent is, well, what are you doing as a business that's going to add that 30, 40 percent as well for yeah. the individual? How are you going to further support them? What are you evolving to ensure they can do that as well? And it's not about, you know, the kind of nice little perks of, um, obviously they don't matter as much now like beer fridges and ping pong tables yeah. but also you know like swag and all that kind of thing it might make someone feel good but it's not really going to stay the course when someone's struggling around yeah. it I think it's it's really looking at how you're developing their mindset how are you providing them with that proactive support um, having those conversations having that space where they feel comfortable whether that's through like anonymous feedback regularly as well um, whether that's you setting the tone and having those conversations and encouraging people around it rather than just seeing it as this reactive thing of oh i'll deal with it when it comes up yeah yeah for sure and i think that leads us nicely on to you know a, a, a big phrase that's been coined recently is, and it's this great resignation um you know i think 41 percent of global workforces um have or thinking about handing their their notice in which is which is huge and i guess you know from what we've discussed so far and you know what you guys have obviously experienced over the last kind of couple of years is is there a thing that's driving this is there a common trend there is a number of things that have kind of you know brought us to this this great resignation uh liz maybe we'll start with you yeah sure i think i i, I have to say that it's a combination of things uh, it's just yeah. been such a perfect storm of all sorts of crazy events over the last couple of years um i do personally i think sometimes it's 
you know, if you're having a bad day, you can grab your work spouse and go for a walk around the block and blow off some steam and, you know, do all those types of things that get you into your next meeting prepared for whatever. But if you live alone or you live with a flatmate that you're not that close to, um, you know, you don't get that kind of release through the day. And oftentimes the people that you work with, like a lot of the companies that we're, that we're talking about or that we're involved in, really cherish culture and cherish like the types of people that they're bringing into the business, a lot of like-minded individuals. And if you don't have those types of relationships that can get you through the, you know, the missing your number or the, you know, person that hung up on you or told you to get lost, like then it can become, you don't, you don't build yourself up. You just constantly get knocked down. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's hard to, hard to find that inspiring after a certain amount of time. Like there's never a problem if people are winning, but if people aren't, then, they start to look around at what else they could be doing in order to be happier. And sometimes that's just not being at work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Chris, anything from your side? Yeah, I completely agree with what uh, Liz said there. I think there's two things for me. I think it's the, the lack of patience and this um, intent on feeling like you need to find your purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, the lack of patience, I think it's, it's an art, it's a skill. And I think we've kind of lost that in a world of instant with a lot of things in our life of thinking we almost need to, have this kind of instant um, gratification, instant recognition of thinking, you know, as soon as I'm in a role, I'm then thinking about the next role and like why I'm not there yet. And um, Mm. that kind of feeling of lack of patience driven by uh, your friends, your family, and also like things like LinkedIn as well, like seeing how other people are doing and almost thinking like, oh, maybe I need to move on. Maybe I'm, you know, too long in this role or, you know, this is what my friends are doing and they've come out of uni and they're doing this now and I'm not. Um, and actually not really driving it. And also, I think the, the purpose side of things of people almost feeling like, you know, they need to find their purpose really early on. And and yeah. sometimes I think sales can be that case where people can end up resenting themselves in sales because they think, well, I haven't found it yet. And why am I in sales? And they can almost like start to resent it, how sales used to be seen as well from a lot of people and maybe still is from the majority yeah. of people of having this feeling of, well, you know, what's my purpose? Like I need to be doing something more. I think, again, you know, going back to what we were talking about before, yeah, there are still people motivated by money, but I think there's a lot of people motivated by something bigger now. Um, mm. And there's almost that rush to feel like I need to find it so early on. And and this is why it's important to provide that environment and that support to kind of reassure people and help provide them with a the space to recognize that it often is it really driven by you. It's often driven by external factors. And you may then go and do something, leave something and realize, oh, actually, I, I that was a good thing. I mean, Chris, you obviously speak to, you know, lots of different businesses and sales leaders. You know, we were speaking just before this webinar about the challenges of hiring now um, and retaining good talent. And and when we're on the kind of topic of that great resignation, have you spoke to any businesses that are really trying to be forward thinking in this space? For example, you know, offering people sabbaticals if they are feeling burnt out. Anything kind of along, along those lines that you've seen? Yeah, I think, um, I suppose it's like relationships really, isn't it? Friends, family, or other halves is you can come from the mindset of, oh, are they going to leave me? Or you can come from the mindset of, well, how do we just keep doing what we're doing? And and I don't need to worry about it. Um, yeah. You know, if I'm still putting the effort in, then they are. And I think it's important with that as well with, with companies feeling like rather than how do we stop them leaving is actually going, well, how do we just make it a, a more enjo- a, a, the same kind of environment or evolve it for them as well? Yeah. I think um, it's good to have sabbaticals. You know, I've seen people saying now that they've got unlimited mental well-being days. But again, that's just like saying we've got paracetamol on tap here. Um, It's not necessarily the answer. It's like this reactive thing that sounds good, but it's more about, well, how do you stop people feeling like they need to have these unlimited mental well-being days? Or, you know, yes, I'm not saying how do you stop people having sabbaticals because it's important, but sometimes it's thinking, what can we do to maybe ensure that when people do want them they do really want them rather than just thinking they want them so i think it's thinking more about the kind of proactive side of things and and how they develop them um you know we, we didn't touch on this but around rather than these kind of one to two days of training of of sales training is how do we give them skills life skills and how do we develop yeah. their emotional intelligence how do we maybe equip them to feel more comfortable um around having these conversations with with insights with their prospects um, yeah. and customers versus making them feel like they're just another sort of dot on the page. Yeah, I 100% agree. And maybe you've kind of led nicely into there. We, we've maybe got one time for one more quick topic, and that is around sales training, you know, something that obviously, you know, we're, we're passionate here about at How Now. Um, 
you know, in, in this new world, like where are people, you know, getting their sales training from? Where are they like improving their skills and their development? Um, you know, personally speaking, you know, managing a team, um, conducting sales training, you know, over Zoom or remote is challenging for sure. You know, um, you know, Liz, maybe, maybe you can start with this um, as you're kind of managing a, a fairly big sales team. H how are you kind of conducting sales training now? Has it changed? And I guess from a one to one perspective, are you finding salespeople are going to different resources for training, different techniques? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. I think, especially having taken on a new team uh, in January, I was trying to feel them out also and figure out what's, what would work best for them and for their dynamic. Um, and I, I just found it funny that like some of the trainings I spent the least amount of time on building um, were some of the most effective because they just facilitated a good conversation. Um, so we did one on storytelling where it was like, okay, take a case study, make it sound like you actually wrote it and then say it back to your peer. And like, I literally put the training together in like 15 minutes and it was like by far one of the best ones we did because it just forced people to listen to one another and to engage with one another. Going back to the osmosis point, you know, we yeah. can't, we can't inorganically create that, but um, you know, there are ways to kind of put people in a position where they have to speak and you can hear people um, to be able to do that. I think things are changing though. It's, it's, you know, it's it's not the same as it was before. And if you if you don't adapt, then, you know, your team will suffer as a result. Um, I think also just being being able to point people towards resources, like not thinking that you have to have everything that's necessary in order to give everything to every person. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes your biggest uh, weapon or not weapon, but asset as a manager um, is being able to say, like, I don't know, but that person does. Or I met this person at an event. You should go have coffee with them um, or bring your team to events. Um, I think those are all really important things that um, that can help them, again, feel more connected to you and connected to the company because it's not just about you being able to deliver on XYZ by the end of the quarter. It's you being able to be propped up by the resources that you know that this company is connected to and can help help you grow. Um, yeah. 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 It sounds like, um, yeah, I love that. It sounds like you're doing a lot of like collaboration, a lot of like collaborative training, which is, which is great to hear. Mm -hmm. um, Chris, how about yourself? Uh, yeah, I, I love Liz's point around the the format of training. I think mm -hmm. um, even in face to face, sometimes people over focus on I need to be the person who has all the answers, or I need to talk at people. But it is those interactive sessions, and I've found this mm -hmm. with evolving what we do with sales psyche recently. We've started doing more interactive ones where we get people into a space or a round table and um, seeing that people that's where they find the most value as well. Because it's good to understand the theory and all the other bits around it. But it's like, well, how is someone else using this? And also just hearing that someone else is struggling with this makes me feel better about it. And I think it's not just about the format, but also the topics. So, for example, I was doing a, a session um, last week with a company and we were talking about limiting beliefs, about some of the things that come up within the sales role. And a lot of people's feedback was, you know, what? I've never really talked about that. You know, it's nice to actually have that as the focal point. We, we focus on, you know, closing, we focus on negotiation, but let's focus on the things that maybe are the elephant in the room. And get those out on the table and the people were saying you know just by hearing what other people are thinking it it makes me feel a bit more reassured about it as well because i don't think it is just about there's still a place for like those one or two days of training but it is again similar to what we talked about today how do you evolve it and give people that kind of more on demand side of things as well because that's how people are learning through you know you look at youtube for example if you want to find out something you, you go to YouTube, you don't go on a one or two day course, you just Google it or you go on YouTube. So it's kind of like, how do you Very create true. that environment as well for, for people to learn in uh, on the job? Yeah, it's that, I guess, on demand learning, right, is what people are expecting now. Hmm. Um, cool, I think that's time, guys. We've, we've run over by three minutes, um, but I think we can kind of end it there. And um, yeah, if anyone uh, uh, on the webinar wants to ask any questions, um, now's the time to do so. As our um, head of marketing said, uh, it's not very common people ask questions in in webinars, so um, you guys might have got away with this. <laughs> um, cool. Okay, we will um, kind of um, wrap up there. Um, thanks, Chris. Thanks, Liz, for joining us today. Um, before we do so, any kind of um, last words that you want to kind of share? Any insights, um, Chris? Um, I think obviously, you know, where I'm coming from around the mental well-being and mindset side of things. I think the biggest thing is just looking, how do you create something 
that is sustainable if you are looking to grow if you are looking to develop how are you creating that sustainable culture for people yeah. to if you are going to be keeping growing you know increasing targets and so on how are you ensuring that people can do that on a sustainable level versus getting to the point where they're burnt out or need time off and then yeah. going around in circles around it and just thinking you know what kind of culture are we creating here because if we do create the right kind of culture then we'll attract the right kind of people and the people will want to stay and we won't yeah. need to demand it um we'll just create the culture where people feel inspired to want to be part of it yeah 100 percent agree love that um liz yeah i guess i just want to say thank you for for facilitating this conversation and for opening it up i think you know if anyone says they have hybrid working or remote learning or uh, mental health in the workplace totally hacked i'd i'd call them out on it um and so i think these types of conversations are super important and i'm really happy to have been able to participate today so thank you cool thanks liz thanks chris and thanks everyone for joining have a great day yeah thanks everyone have a good thank day you. bye james bye liz bye, bye.